Hello, hello, and welcome back for part two of Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2, where we're going to take a look at what some other people have been up to in the last uh, stream or two. And so here we are, you join me in another orbit. This one is around Njord, and as you can see, quite clearly see down here, this is uh, one of Tristan's planets. And he's come out here, and he's building up more or less the same sort of system as the ones I've been building. The first thing I noticed, actually glancing at this, is that his trains are going in the opposite direction. They're going um, anti-clockwise around the loop instead of clockwise, so that looks very strange to me, just taking a glance at it. And also his train's a little bit shorter. He's got a two-wagon train instead of a four. Um, I mean, there's no problem it's with that it's perfectly functional it just looks slightly weird coming coming over here and seeing it it's also quite notable that this this planet is much much smaller than um, the Norvis and I think smaller than some of the other ones we've been looking at because it's only taking 545 pieces of cable in order to finish off the elevator so that's going to be much more quickly built I also noticed that the well the bots have just have just finished off laying out the space up here so here we've got another one of those lovely arrow shaped um, wedge spaceships that's going to be coming out here there's a bit more stuff needs to go in over here Tristan's clearly dropped in a blueprint on top of a um, uh, an, an area that's still being built and then probably again and then and it just needs to be placed again and then they can finish this off with the the extra warehouses on the sides here and then any and, and, and the rest of the belts and so on and so this is going to be essentially working in exactly the same way as the as the one you, you, you saw yesterday in orbit around Agnea we've got a, the stuff's coming up being put into a warehouse and then being dumped into three of these which can then and then it can be passed straight into the spaceship by all of these superior uh, long inserters that will pass all of the the uh, the goodies or and well the good the uh, useful stuff and the junk out of here into the spaceship where it can be taken away and all dealt with in in over on um, on Norvis because that's how we're how, how we're running it it looks like we're also uh, request going to be requesting Vulcanite to be brought over to this planet as well so that's another reason why I need to get Agnea running and supplying it probably a significantly higher rate than it is at the moment um, so yeah we're going to need a good supply of Vulcanite coming out there so it can be then be shipped off to all of the other planets that need it and that's going to be there's going to be quite a lot of them it does look like Tristan's own requesting Vulcanite though so that's a little bit easier so those can then be passed down here there's a, interestingly there seems to be a bipe there's 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 something funny going on over here this um, the, the, this loader here needs to be probably needs to be reprogrammed because it shouldn't be sending um, anything around here uh, that's that's very strange. I don't. I don't. I, I, I don't know why it's been set up like that. Um, maybe that. Oh, maybe that's because of when when we we're setting it up for the previous design. No, nope, I have no idea why that would be sent up like that. I. I to guess, I'm going to say it's because he was setting up one of these on Snowdrop, which is the Cryonite planet, and he and this, that was being done with the old system where you ended up with a little bit of junk over here. So it was going to be this was going to be a system for passing that out down here, and there was going to be a filter set on here, but that doesn't seem to have been done. So um, I think that's just. That's a bit of an aberration that probably needs to be fixed, um, and so yes, that that'll pass. Then pass the uh, the Vulcanite down this belt to go into the train down here. I no, this is no, this is just batteries. Maybe he doesn't need Vulcanite over here. But then, in what, why is there a an unloading system at all? I don't know. It's probably just not finished yet. In fact, it's clearly not finished yet because there's massive gaps up here. But it's working, going in the in the right sort of general direction. This area is presumably also going to have a power supply dump put in as well. So a big area of scaffolding down here with a load of solar panels on it and hooked up to here. But again, that hasn't been done yet. If we look down on the ground for the associated planet, well, you can see along here, it's a similar sort of general idea. There's the, We're having the um, a loading station down here. There's no unloading going on down here. So perhaps he doesn't need Vulcanite down here. And that stuff up on in orbit is just an aberration and needs to be, de needs to be got rid of. But this will allow the train to come down, fill up with all of the stuff and take it back up again. It does also look here like, um, again, not finished. So He's just got this one belt of um, of holmium coming through, and he hasn't got the the other waste products from the uh, from the from the um, from the core processing being brought over yet. But I'm, I'm sure again, I'm sure all of that will be done in due time. Notably, Tristan has been very busy, and there's been this this is this is over on Snowdrops. So there's another place where an, an infrastructure has been being added in, and so over here you can see um, we've got a, again the same sort of idea. And uh, this one is complete, so we've got um, a, tra a train system that'll, that'll pick up the that'll bring up the um, the cryonites to orbit. Over here we do have an unloading system, which is a little bit over the top for what he needs, because all he's bringing out here is the batteries for the trains, the cable to keep the elevator going, and uh, meteor defense ammo. And then he's put his meteor defense system up in orbit around the planet, which makes a lot of sense. You might as well because that's where the, the uh, spaceship is going to be bringing it all to and it's a little bit over the top because I think his uh, meteor defense area is actually probably bigger than all of the rest of his space area put together which is a bit crazy. 
Uh, but yeah, it makes sense to have it up in space because then when the ship brings over the uh, the ammunition for it, you can just pass it straight through into here and, it, and it'll work really nicely. So that's 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 all great. Now what you'll notice here is that we are notably missing the um, the solar arrays that we normally have on these on the in these orbital areas, uh, and that's slightly funny because this is this seems to be more or less finished, and that is because Snowdrop is a long long way out from the uh, from the sun. So if we look at the um, look at the the map here, you can see sun all the way up here. So Agnea, the planet I've been going to, has a solar level of 111%. So Norvis is 100%, Agnea is slightly better. So you put solar panels around Agnea, you get loads of power from them. Out here at Snowdrop, on the other hand, we only have a solar power of 22%. So you'd need to put out five times as many solar panels to get the energy over here. And so... Tristan has put in a beam receiver down on Snowdrop, and the beam receivers, they do, the power does drop off a little bit with distance, but nothing like as much as the solar power does. So it's far more effective to have this down here, drop it in, and by the looks of all of this stuff around and about it, I would say there used to be a nuclear uh, reactor here, maybe four nuclear reactors in, in a neat little square, and he's come along and ripped them up and replaced them with this uh, energy beam receiver. And this is, as you, as you can see over there on the right hand side, is gradually warming up. Um, it's got to almost 8,000 degrees centigrade which is more than enough for these basic boilers that he's using over here. These ones require a temperature of at least 415 degrees, and he's at uh, about 20 times that now. So these are definitely going to be uh, boiling the water quite happily. At some point in the future, I'll probably replace these with high-temperature ones. But to be honest, at the moment, it probably doesn't matter a great deal because we've got plenty of steam available, plenty of power. Um, yeah, he's using about a third of the, of the available power. So that this system is absolutely fine. The beam receiver is generating more than enough power to keep Snowdrop up and happy and producing all the cryonite he needs. And then down here at the um, at the bottom, we've got the, the standard, again, the standard system. You're very used to this by now. And this one has been finished off. So we've got all of the waste products from all of the, uh, the processing now just being flooded out through here and brought over to uh, brought brought over to the train so it can take that them up and dump them into a spaceship there is a supply of cryonite coming up here but it's all getting scooped up by the delivery cannons along here so um we're not actually sending any of this out to the spaceship just yet. This is going to need to be significantly increased in order for that to work. So that's uh, yet another thing for him to do. But once we've got enough um, enough cryonite being produced, and perhaps when we deactivate some of these guns, because we reckon there's going to be, we want to ship it out another way then hopefully we'll get a bit of cryonite passing down the belt over here, going into the warehouse and eventually being loaded into the train. But for now, this whole system is a, a rather over spec way of bringing mostly mostly stone and sand and a few other little, by, little bits of byproducts over to, over to Norbit to, for us to have a look at. Um, yeah, mostly, as I say, mostly stone and sand, although there's, there's some ores as well that could be quite useful. If we have another look back up in orbit, we can see that, um, yeah, he's got he's got a reasonable amount in here. He's, he's got up to uh, 200 stacks in, in each of these, roughly. So the spaceship is almost half full. So, yeah, he's producing that quite, quite reasonably quickly. And actually, he's made about... 7,000 cryonite and ship that up to here as well. So maybe we'll be able to use that to, to sort of, to get all the things in Norbit that are requiring uh, cryonite to be delivered by delivery cannon, to get them going so that we can deactivate some of the delivery cannons down here on Snowdrop and then start getting the these uh, cryonite flowing around here so we can start to fill the spaceship up with it and, you know, get the system working again. Because if we look along here, we can see this one's firing at Norbit, this one's firing at Actually, not fi not firing anywhere. That's 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 easy to replace. That one's at Norbit. That one's at Norvis. But then we can ship stuff from Norvis, Norbit to Norvis. This one's this one's on Njord, So that one's going to take a while to get uh, get switched over. And Talos. So again, probably going to take a while. Bigrid again, a while. Norbit again, so that probably could be replaced fairly soon. And again, Norbit, so again, could be replaced fairly soon. So if we can get rid of most of those, well, let's have a look. This one is taking a lot of the um, the lot of the cryonite is coming through, and that that one's going to Njord. So that's that. Big. Okay, the worst offender is one of the ones we can't replace yet. So okay, it looks like he's just going to have to massively expand the production over here. And we're using well, he's, he's moved up to the most modern machines we've got at the moment, and it's full of uh, tier three productivity modules. So I think that's. It, it's current state of the art uh, over here, but I guess it's just not dealing with it quickly enough. Um, perhaps we need, yeah, we've got, we've not got the cores coming in quickly enough here. Perhaps maybe he needs to go out and set up some cryonite mines. Maybe because I think he's now probably got virtually all of the. Oh no, no, I take it back. He hasn't got virtually all of the core seams on this planet. So to get more stuff coming in, I, he could go out and and and. and um, 
start mining from a lot more of these core seams, but he's going to need to get a huge number. So we've got one, two, one, two, three, four, five, five at the moment. So he's going to need to get up to 25 of them to double the speed it's coming through at, and that's a lot. That's probably going to be all of them around, well, all of them in the area that's been explored so far, perhaps. It would probably be easier to go out and just mine up this patch of uh, 44 million cryonite and ship that in, or this one up here of 23 million that's really, really close. So when we started playing this, I, I did. I really, really wanted to go on a sort of a on a on a push to basically just use core mining for everything, and that was the whole reasoning behind these systems. The idea behind this was that the um, we'd be able to use the byproducts from the core mining in order to make the delivery cannon capsules in order to ship out the cryonites, and the whole thing would be completely self-contained. Now that was wildly optimistic. Um, we weren't we weren't able to make the capsules fast enough, which is why we've got the delivery cannon chests here to bring in the parts to make to make more, 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 more delivery cannon capsules um, and generally at least certainly on the smaller planets we haven't been able to pull the ore out of these patches remotely fast enough in order to, to just use core mining so it was a it was a bit over optimistic and a bit maybe a, a touch naive and it's which is a bit of a shame because it, I, I felt it was a lovely idea and I think it would have worked in 0.5 with just one person playing but with 0.6 I think the core mining has been made quite a bit harder because you have to get out and find the core patches and also with lots of us playing, I think we're using the resources up quite a lot faster than I was when I was just uh, when I was just on my own. The other end of the beam receiver is, of course, in uh, Kalidus orbit over here. And I can't remember if I showed you this last time, but now we've got we've got three of these up and running. There's a little bit of a little bit of construction going on over here, but we've got we've got a, a huge quantity of these solar panels. And as you can see, we're generating 21 gigawatts using 18, uh, so that's working really really nicely. And over here, we, you, you can see the number the number of these injector. Each one of these energy beam injectors uses a gigawatt in order to uh, to, to create an energy beam. Uh, to, sorry, to power the energy beam. Then each one of the emitters also uses a gigawatt just to sort of just to point the beam in the right place. So you only get the energy through from these ones, and it takes an extra gigawatt. And we've got two of these wandering around on Norbis, and I did show you those. I remember showing you those last week. So we've got two of these wandering around on Norbis, killing biters, and then we've got a third one keeping the beam receiver warm in order to keep Tristan's uh, planet out there powered. And yeah, as I was saying, it makes a lot of sense to use a beam power beam power for Snowdrop. For everywhere else, it makes a lot more sense to just put a load of solar panels in orbit and then run the power down the space elevator. If we ever decide we're getting through too much space elevator cable and decide we need to use fewer space elevators, then we might do beam power on some of the other planets as well. But for now, the only one where it's really worthwhile is Snowdrop. And looking at the map, if we ever do go to Oliran, which I think is the um, was the Iron Planet, yes, the Iron Planet, then maybe we'll use another beam power. Beam, we'll use beam power for that one. Taras is an interesting, interesting one. I mean, these are, Taras and um, Njord are at about 36, 37 percent. So they're they're not too bad. Well, they are they are fairly bad, but you probably could get away with sol with solar power down the space elevator. They're that sort of borderline, but these ones are just going to be such a pain to keep uh, to keep working. Um, that it, you get so little power through. It just doesn't seem worth it. And while we're on the subject of spaceports and things, Mark has now fitted um, a the, has fitted the spaceport, the spaceship docking and landing area for uh, for Mike's planet of Kothar. This is up in in orbit over Kothar. You can see all of the solar up here because because he, um, Mike is Mike is presumably using quite a lot of power. Um, no, he's just over spec a bit, so he's got he's, he's got three times the amount of power he needs. So that's going to give him some headroom for when he does some expansion. So that's that's fair enough. Then over here, yes, we have the we have the spaceship which has landed. Now um, this one is slightly different from the rest of it, as you'll notice. There is a fluid tank on the spaceship, and that is because uh, in order to make the iridium, Mike needs enormous quantities, or at least significant quantities, of mineral water. And you can't get mineral water on Kothar. There just aren't any nice deposits of it. And so we got absolutely fed up of delivering, sending it over by delivery cannon in barrels because that is horrible. We did briefly consider putting a barrels of, of mineral water in the spaceship in one of the warehouses, which would have meant you'd be able to bring more stuff back from Kothar because you'd have three warehouses in the ship, but barrels are horrible. So we're bringing over the uh, mineral water in this uh, storage tank, in, in, in this storage tank here. Then we can pump it out into this one, and then from there it can pass round and go into in, go into the train over here. Now I am wondering if whether M Mike has done the maths for how much mineral water he's going to need. But you remember yesterday I was talking about considering bringing over the um, petroleum gas or possibly even crude oil over to. Agnea in order to make the sulfur, to, in case that would allow me to bring a little bit more out. And it turned out no, 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 it really, really, really didn't. It was much, much worse. However, 
if there's enough mineral water in this tank when it's full to allow uh, Mike to create, generate two warehouses worth of stuff, so iridium and 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 the miscellaneous byproducts, then this would be this this system will work quite nicely. So maybe he has done the maths. Maybe he's just going to give it a shot, see what happens, and hope for the best. I, I guess we'll find out. But yes, that can be passed out down here, and Mike has gone slightly on a slightly different design here because he's got fluids and solids. He's got two separate trains, and to be honest, I think that makes sense. Having a single train with with uh, normal wagons and fluid wagons just feels like unnecessary complications. So he's he's gone for the two separate ones, and as I say, I think that makes sense. So this one will bring down the um, bring down the mineral water whenever it's required. It seems to be full now. I'm not sure why it hasn't set off. Um, because it hasn't been programmed yet, fair enough. Work in progress and all that. Uh, this one is taking down all the stuff that's being used down on the planet. So he's got, at the moment, that seems to just be um, meteor defense ammo. But at some point in the future, that will also include vulcanite. And if he's really lucky, maybe it'll include processed vulcanite. We'll have to see about that one because I haven't decided how we're going to how we're going to do that yet. At the moment, it's being sent over by delivery cannon, which is kind of okay because it's not needed in quite the same quantities as other stuff. But we do want to move away from the delivery cannons as and when we can. Notably, Mike has used um, a pair of stations here, so he's got one for unloading and then one for reloading, um, which makes the does make the, uh, the, the setting setting the system up a little bit easier. Um, but normal, but uh, as I showed before, you can get around it by just put, putting some by programming your filters. The interesting thing about oh no, I was going to say the interesting thing about the way he's done this is it means he can just have a single um, battery unload and reload and recharge place over here. Um, that will then that will do one what that will do the front locomotive when the train stops at this station and then do the rear locomotive when it stops at this one but sadly he hasn't actually done that he's got he's got it being loaded and unloaded at both front and back for when it when it's parked here i thought he'd been really clever then but um, it turns out no sorry <laughs> Other than that, I say the system works exactly as you'd expect. Oh, he's bringing the um, he's bringing the cables up for the elevator over here like that, which is, is fine. That will work quite uh, perfectly well. Um, I'm a little bit concerned he's going to get a, j a jam on this belt with uh, with uh, when the cables uh, when the cables sort of feed all the way back down here. It's going to get to here, and then the, the the meteor defense ammo and anything else, and probably vulcanite at some point that he's bringing in here, won't be able to get passed through this filter, and the batteries won't be able to get passed as well. So this looks like a, a, there's some, going to be some problems here. I think he's going to need a storage system up here. Oh, he has got a storage system up here, so he's going to need to hook these up and tell the um, and tell the sh and, and tell send a signal over to say don't bring all that stuff over. But you know, again, I think this is sort of I think this is all work in progress stuff. He's not quite got the system finished, so you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna criticize too much but, um, and I'm not I'm not going to nitpick something that hasn't been finished at least no more than I already have and so down below on the merry planet of Kothar Mike has been expanding things and getting the um, getting the iridium production back up to speed so as you can see here we've got a nice healthy supply of the uh, red cation beads being made so those can all pour down absolutely pour down here into the um, into the iridium powdering process so he's got loads of that coming through Previously, the other thing he was short of um, the vulcanite in order to in order to make these, and that's why it was struggling last week. But now it looks like the vulcanite production is nice and healthy. He's got 540 in this warehouse, which isn't a huge amount, but it's enough. That it seems to be enough to keep the system happy. So I'm not going to I'm, I'm going to assume that's the amount he's asking for. As if I haven't been just ripping up all of the vulcanite production on Agnea and, and, and breaking everything. But that does seem to be working quite nicely. So down here, presumably, yes, all these machines seem to now be running flat out. And that means he's pulling through all of the uh, the crushed irid iridite that, was coming, that he had from before. Uh, and so, well, these are still full, these are still full. But he's emptied this warehouse. This one is gradually emptying through this one into here. So yes, he's, he's actually now slowly using the iridium up ever so slightly faster than he was uh, than, he, than he's digging it up so he's working through this buffer here but it's pretty close so I would say that when the when the uh, when the system has used up all of its buffer and it just drops down to pulling it through here well maybe he could put in an additional belt coming down here to fill this one up slightly quicker and it would run ever so slightly faster but basically I would say this is now running at about the right sort of this is running at the right sort of speed everything looks quite well balanced I'd say so um, it's almost as if he's put some actual de design deliberation into it uh, this seems to be roughly the right number of machines to, to use the belt up it's not running uh, I don't know these belts aren't running flat out but the input belts are and so that's what matters. All the machines seem to be running. I can see lots and lots of green. I can see green lights on this side, actually. I can see red lights on this side. All right, why are you sad? You've not got enough nitric acid. 
Okay, so it looks like the nitric acid needs a bit of a boost to production in order to get the other side of all these machines running. But then if he does that, he's going to need to have twice as many of, um, of these machines in order to produce the, uh, the crushed ore that he needs. And then he's going to need more mines because there's a bit of a gap in there. So, in a way, it kind of doesn't matter. The, uh, the supply of ir iridium seems to be pretty good. He's got a, a nice healthy supply of blast cake coming out here coming all the way around here to then be cooked down into the ingots. It's, yeah, there's, there is room for expansion, but at the moment it's running at a, at, a, at a nice healthy speed, I would say. In fact, he's even managing to load up these stations over here. So, again, once again, he's got a lot of the iridium being fed out to these delivery cannons, going to probably mostly to Norbit and Norvis, or wherever iridium is needed. And then a little, and then the rest of it is then being trickled out into the into the stations here. And presumably, once this gets to the point where it, 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 there's a train load, a train will turn up here, and then we'll carry it from the Iridium Ingot pickup all the way up to the space elevator drop off train here. And then it, we can be then from there. Well, it can then start to be start to be brought up. At the moment, we do have a train's worth here, so I guess things just haven't quite been activated yet. But in theory, this is going this is going to be where where the Iridium is brought up from, and presumably also the junk. I haven't seen him doing that yet, but I imagine he's going to be done eventually. And as you can see over here, he is hoping for vulcanite and um, enriched vulcanite to be brought down here so that he can use those for his other um, for his other other steps uh, eventually yes uh, but it's going to be a little while until we've got the supply up and stable enough for that for now you're just going to have to be delivery cannons and also then the uh, mineral water being brought along to hit to here um, I don't know why there's a second station maybe it's in case he ever wants to take any liquids back up to send them back to Norvis I don't know if that's going to be a thing he's ever going to want to do but it looks like it potentially could be and then we can just pump the uh, the mineral water over here into the tank and there's a train ready to take it away so yeah this looks like there's some, been some good big steps forward going on here um, I would say the the um, he's now waiting for a lot of the supplies to be made ready for him uh, but there's a little bit of finishing off to do as well so he's in yeah in a good position Last week, we all looked at the uh, the state of the factory and why it had ground to a halt and said, oh look, your iridium water is, uh, is overflowing, you need to deal with that, and the clean water uh, levels as well. And he, ha he has done so. There is a, now a second row of um, machines across the top here, I, th I think that's probably new, and also some beacons here to make everything run really, really quickly. And that has successfully dealt with the problem, and oh, he's just venting all of the water off, which is... <laughs> uh, it, it's wasteful, but uh, and it probably doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know what he's planning to do with it all, but he does have a nice big lake of it over here, so he can he can pull out as much as he wants, and and, and yeah, I suppose just just waste it rather than keeping keep it looped round looping round and round. I guess in order to reuse it, he would have to feed it over to the sulfuric acid production or the nitric acid production, which is ah oh yes, it's down here, this little this little patch down here. So the uh, the excess water is coming out up here. And it's not being passed down here because laziness, I guess, probably. Uh, but um, but never mind. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. It's just water, which is literally a free resource. Uh, so yes, he's upgraded the nitric acid production as well. He says it's a minor and horrible upgrade. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what he means by um, minor and horrible in that context. Maybe it means he's just dropped this um, beacon in the middle, although that looks looks like too good a fit to have just been dropped in as a, oh no, we don't have enough. Maybe it's because he's put speed modules in all of these machines rather than putting in more machines and productivity modules. Um, I'm not sure, but whatever whatever it is, it seems to have, it's increased the nitric acid production, but not by quite as much as he's going to need it to be uh, increased by in the long run. So. Partial success, I guess? We'll call it a partial success, yes. He's also upgraded the modules in the actual Iridium production. I assume that means it's now tier 3 everywhere and speed modules and speed beacons and all that sort of stuff. So it's now working as fast as fast and as productively, product, productively as as, uh, as we could possibly want. Including over here as well. Well, except that he's still got the old style beacons in here. But that doesn't really matter because he's got the tier 3 productivity modules in here, which is the best we're using at the moment in general. Um, and he's not using all of his um, in, in furnaces. So to be honest, it doesn't really matter that these, they're running slightly slower than they might it probably means he's using slightly less electricity so you know sure but it's it's, it, it's fine and i think that pretty much covers the changes that have been happening on Co out on kothar next we're going to head over to norvis here on norvis mark has done some further important work with the um, heat shield tile production He's um, fixed a broken station down here. I can't remember which one it was that was broken, but there, there was apparently a broken station. We've had some upgrades in here that are now making things run a little bit quicker. That's interesting. The um, because of this because of the frame rate, the purple belts looked like they were running backwards on my screen. Um, I don't know if they did on yours. I don't know whether the video is going to be at the same frame rate as the uh, as the recording, but maybe it did. It was very confusing for a moment. Anyway, yes, so we have now all of the uh, the ingredients being pumped in up here. We've got pro full productivity modules and speed modules on all of these. And I thought Mark said he'd changed the recipe that was being used for the heat shields, but I don't think he has, because that looks pretty normal. 
Yes, yes, it's currently using this recipe. Ah, and at some point it'd probably be quite nice to switch over to this recipe, but we need to have we need to have a nice healthy supply of iridium available and just generally make sure we've got make sure we've got lots of iridium and make sure it's being brought down to Norvis in order to get that set up. So at some point we'll probably switch this over. And that will save us an enormous quantity of sulfur because it goes from eight sulfur per tile to half a sulfur per tile. It will save us a lot of stone as well, because it will go from 20 to 2. But it will start using half an iridium plate instead of the two steel plates. So I think overall that is going to be a massive, massive improvement. But it's going to need us to have a healthy supply of iridium first. And so once once Mike has got the, sy the system supplying the iridium by spaceship, and we can start bringing it down in trains, shipping it over here, all that sort of fun stuff, it's going to be fairly easy to, to get that upgraded. Because all we'll need to do is switch this station here over to bringing in iridium. And then at some, somewhere along here, we'll have a system that will turn the iridium ingots into iridium plates. And then it can just be pumped into the, exactly the same machines. It'll work in exactly the same way. Okay, all of the ratios on these uh, stone tiles will be wrong. But that's not actually a problem. Um, it'll, be a, it'll just be a nice easy switch to move over from one to the other. So I think we'll do that as soon as we've got a good supply of iridium available. Um, at the moment, I don't think we want to put in a delivery cannon related supply because you can see how how much sulfur we're getting through here. It's absolutely pouring through, but it's still not enough. It's it's not able to, it's not able to keep up. Even when a train a train turns up, it dumps it all in here and it just gets swallowed up in in moments. So we're not we're still not making the um, the heat shield tiles quite as quickly as we would like to. That said, we do have almost two train loads in in this warehouse and a train load in the well in the train so that's going pretty well we um it may, maybe the heat shield tile crisis that we had has now been has now been we've now got past it but it would be nice to switch over to the cheaper method of producing them at some point anyway uh looks like from mark's notes the reason that we have um ha have, have that working again is because he's upgraded the sulfur production so that's presumably going to be in here um <laughs> okay, he's upgraded it by filling absolutely all of these machines with speed modules. So now this system is going to be running along at astonishing speeds. Uh, it's not going to be very efficient, but it's going to be producing a lot of sulfur. I wonder if he's putting any extra machines for making it. No, these are all directly making the acid and make, yeah, making the acid here. So great, but it does feel a little um, expensive. That said, any other sort of upgrade would would require a huge rebuild. So I'm. I can I can definitely sympathise with doing it like this, um, even, even if it's not going to be the most productive way of doing it. Um, you know, these ones don't even have um, productivity modules in them. In fact, most of Big Oil seems to be a little bit dated. This, this possibly needs a, an upgrade, but it's such a big area that it's going to be a, it's going to be a big job to upgrade all of this. So I don't think anybody really wants to do it. There's other stuff that's more interesting and probably more important. <laughs> Mark says he's also started bringing more stuff up to uh, Norbits, where specifically solar panels and rare metals, and I assume that's all being fed into the uh, into the into the train down here. So yeah, we've got a load of we've got got a load of the advanced slightly advanced solar panels in here, which we then need to make the properly advanced solar panels. And presumably he's squeezed in a rare metal belt somewhere around here. Yeah, there's rare metals. I don't know why. Maybe he's brought them to somewhere else up in Norbit. Maybe that's for some something else. I. I mean, it could be for this one. This looks like it's going to the streams area to me, or it could be this one, which is going to the material science part. No, I, I, I'm not sure where uh, Mark has be, uh, added more uh, solar panels and rare metals to orbit, but apparently he has. Tristan has also bumped up the amount of lithium that's being brought up for stream creation, to, so uh, to make this train run a bit more often. Because over here in the streams area, it turns out we weren't bringing in enough uh, lithium to completely fill a train up. Which means when we're using lithium in huge quantities, which we do because it's required by... Well, it's required to make the uh, the um, particle stream. This is particle stream, isn't it? Yes, plasma stream. Sorry, it's required to make the plasma stream, the orange clouds that then go into making all of the other different coloured clouds. And we're getting through a lot of blue clouds that also require rare metals which aren't being brought up in sufficient quantities uh, in order to fuel all of our spaceships. So it's not a problem yet but we are definitely going to need more rare metals to be brought up here so that's a, probably another tweak that Tristan's going to want to make so, so, to, 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 uh, to, to make sure we have basically if you make sure we always have we, we're always demanding a train's worth of each of the things here then that means the train will always run. It means you end up with a lot of stuff buffered in the warehouse but it means you don't it also means you don't run out and running out is bad we don't want to do that. 
back down on Norvis. I have also been busy over here. I've um, I've now finished off the uh, the new beryllium intermediates production system. So we've got the um, the beryllium coming in here in ingot form. It's being broken into uh, down into um, plates and then turned into rods with the, with the help of these iron iron rods that are coming through here. Um, <laughs> I've managed to squeeze in an, a third um, system over here. This has all come together quite nicely. We've got one machine that makes the iron rods. Is it that, that one machine is sufficient to produce the iron rods for all three of these um, machines that are making the beryllium rods. And each one of those then goes off to three machines making the aeroframe scaffolds. Uh, this one has stopped because we don't have enough imacite coming through, but that's sort of a... <sighs> It's a known problem. It's because it's coming in by delivery cannon and we don't have a huge supply of it. But to be honest, we don't have an enormous amount of need for these, so it's not the end of the world. But eventually, once we have a, 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 full, a, a nice steady supply of it coming through, we'll then have a set of three of these machines fed by each one of these beryllium stick making machines. Those can then make a flood of the um, beryllium aeroframe space scaffold, which can then come over here to be made into the bulkheads, but also be fed off round here to be made into the, uh, to be taken away by trains. So we've now got two stations here, one to allow the trains to take away the aeroframe scaffold and one to take away the bulkheads. We've also got, this is a, a low density structure drop station here because those are required for making more bulkheads. There seems to be a problem with this. Let's have a quick look and see what that is. So there is a train trying to go to low density structure pickup. It said there's a bit of a train jam going on by the looks of things, but it has cleared out. It is moving. It is entirely possible that there was a shortage of low-density structures for it to pick up from there, or alternatively, that there is somewhere else that is claiming the low-density structures that is closer to this station and therefore a higher priority, and that's why they're not getting brought round to here. What we really need is to have enough beryllium being brought down that we can then produce enough aeroframe scaffolds to keep this system running in order to produce the low density structures from here and get them being fed out. But at the moment, that seems to be a little bit of a pipe dream. Um, although if we look down here, we can see that... Why are you not getting a train? Okay, the, the, the train that would be bringing a train here is um, it's, it's currently going off to pick up some aeroframe scaffolds. Uh, the train limit has been set to set to zero, though, so this station is not asking for them. And that was because we didn't. I, I felt we didn't have the aeroframe scaffolds being made quickly enough to start using them for uh, low density structure per production. I'm still not sure whether we do. Because let's see, over here we have yeah we have we have about a train's worth here, so that is why the train is coming out here. So that means presumably the train is taking all of these over to the to the bus area and, and the spaceport. So at the moment, yeah, I think we still don't have enough of these aeroframe scaffolds in order to, to start making the low density structures from them. And I think the main reason for that is because we don't have enough imacite. So hopefully. At some point in the not too distant future, Mark will have a supply of Imacite available uh, coming in by, tr by spaceship in enormous quantities. We can get this running much more solidly. We can make the, uh, the these aeroframe scaffolds much more quickly. We can dump them all into the, the railway system over here in order for it to take them over here to be made into low density structures in order to be brought back over here to be made into aeroframe scaffolds. Having said it like that, that now makes me wonder whether I should actually just be straight up making the low density structures over here as well and then offering them up both to this machine and to a station. What do we require for that recipe? So over here it's um, it's also glass and plastic and steel so I'd need quite a lot more stations over here um, glass, plastic, steel. There's plenty of room for it though and there's plenty of room for the production system and this could be condensed down quite a bit by using better beacons so Maybe this whole area over here should be decommissioned and made part of this area. I don't know whether I... I mean, it seems like a sensible thing for me to do, but I also don't know if I can really... You know, I don't... Yeah, I mean, I, I should, but I don't know if I want to. I don't know if that's my priority at the moment. Um, let me know what you think. It feels like it's something I... Pro it feels like it would be an improvement, but then on the other hand... So would Astro Science 4, so would getting the Vulcanite flowing a bit faster. So there would many, many other things, and there's only so many hours in a stream. So, yeah, it's temp it is tempting to get the uh, the low density structures being built here as well, but I'm not sure whether it's the whether it's the best idea, best use of my time. I know you're probably absolutely sick of hearing about that planet now, but I also did spend a little bit of time monitoring the Talos ship, just to make sure that things were going okay. And it looks over here, it looks like over here we are waiting for quite a lot more Vulcanite to be delivered, um, and that's presumably why the ship hasn't departed yet. What, 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 what even is the departure conditions over here? Over here we seem to have a, a, a box that's watching for eight dots, and then outputting a launch command when, when it gets eight dots. At the moment it has five dots. I don't know where all these dots come from. Oh, there's, okay, there's some dots over here. 
this this looks like it's not been finished being set up to me but let's see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, potentially coming out of here. Uh, so, the, the, okay, here we go. So we're looking for the amount of fuel. We're looking to make sure we have the right amount of cable. We're looking to see if we've got the right amount of meteor defense ammunition and, and train batteries and filters and also beryllium. Uh, maybe that's meant to be uh, vulcanite. And so when we get, oh, and possibly, and there's probably a sulfur one in here as well, or maybe those come from over here, and this cryonite as well, I, I, yeah. So basically, the, the idea is we watch out to see when we've got all of the things we need. Each one of these things sends out a dot when it's correct, and then we count up the dots. When we've got enough of them, we send a launch signal, and we presumably don't have enough of it yet, because we're still waiting for more vulcanite, more sulfur, more goodness knows what. Um, it's going to be a little while, and this, this spaceship is just going to sit here for a, good, for a good long time. But I think that's, that is, to be honest, a mark problem, although we're going to have to have discussions about what we want to bring over and what's going to work where. Down on Talos, things actually seem to be working fairly well at the moment, except, oh no, we've run out of cryonite, so they're not running well at the moment. Um, we can't do any more until until another, until another some more cryonite arrives. And I have a feeling, yes, I turned off the supply that was being brought in by delivery cannon because I thought I had enough, um, which is hubris and foolishness. However, I think I do need to do, to do a little bit of maths here and try and work out how much of everything is going to be needed in order to keep the uh, the system happy uh, because we need to bring in vulcanite and cryonite definitely and we need to have sulfur or at the very least we need to have sulfuric acid somehow and that mean and we make that means iron and sulfur we have iron here but we don't have sulfur so that definitely needs to be brought in i can't do what i've done on agnea and just produce it from uh, local supplies so let's have a little bit of a look through the numbers here and try and work out what i actually need Okay, so I've run through the numbers. So, as you can see, one, one beryllium ingot requires 250 molten beryllium, which requires 50 beryllium powder and 10 pyroflux. That 10 pyroflux requires one vulcanite block, because uh, it divides nicely like that way, like that. And the 50 beryllium powder requires 50 beryllium hydroxide, which requires one cryonite rod and also some beryllium sulfate. To make enough beryllium sulfate to make one um, one ingot requires 25 sulfuric acid, and 25 sulfuric acid requires two and a half sulfur. So that means in order to make one ingot, we need to bring in one vulcanite block, one cryonite rod, and two and a half um, pieces of sulfur. So that means because the beryllium ingot stacked to 100, whereas the vulcanite and the cryonite stacked to 200, and the sulfur only stacks to 50. That means to make, in order to make one stack of beryllium ingots, we need to bring in half a stack of vulcanite, half a stack of cryo, and five stacks of sulfur. So that's six stacks in total to make one stack of ingots. Now, we're going to be able to make quite a big dent in that with the productivity modules, um, which is going to help a bit. But even so, that seems like, once again, we're going to be bringing in entire spaceship loads of sulfur in order to make significantly less of the thing they're trying to make. So this is again going to be a bit problematic. In fact, this is going to be significantly more problematic because we don't have any oil available on this planet, which is why I've been bringing sulfur in by delivery cannon for so long and, um, and why my head hurts. If we use advanced chemical plants all the way through for the acid stages, all the way from making the acid itself, which we're not yet, but if we do, <clears throat> through all of these stages up here, and then we're using the advanced furnaces here, which we already are, then that will give us a multiplier of about four and a quarter on the sulfur that we're using, down from five stacks of sulfur per stack of, of beryllium ingots, down to just over one. We'll also see fairly significant reductions in the amount of vulcanite and cryonite required, and so that will help. Well, won't help quite as much because we're using it in much much smaller quantities, and they're not going through quite so many stages. But it will definitely help quite a bit. So that will bring us down to almost. Let's say let's say that brings us down to about two stacks of um, of inputs for every stack of ore we're taking away. And we're also going to be take, shipping a certain amount of miscellaneous other stuff. So if we look at this particular random cargo wagon here, you can see that only about a third of the stuff that's gone into it is actually beryllium. So at this point, maybe we will actually be okay with this system and it will it'll turn out that we do have enough space on the spaceship as long as we mostly for, as long as we bring out an enormous quantity of sulfur every time it every time it ships and we try and keep a bit of a buffer over here so yeah actually having looked having done the maths and looked through this it looks like it's going to be feasible but i think i want us to have a huge buffer available out here initially so we'll, we'll fly the ship back and forth a few times basically full of sulfur and with a bit of vulcanite and cryonite as well just to get those built up and then we can sort of try and sort of tease our way through it a bit more slowly and hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll be able to keep up. Um, and the worst case, we can always top it up with the delivery cannons. But 
I would definitely rather avoid that if I can. Oof, that got a bit heavy. I spent a bit more time thinking about that than I really intended to, but uh, never mind. Let's now move on to the next section, which everyone's everyone's favourite part, which is where we take a look at the researchers. So, this week we finished Artillery Range 4, which was... I mean, I don't know why we bothered, to be honest, because we have the beam uh, beam things, although the artillery is quite handy for getting rid of big chunks, of big areas of Bite and Ness and so on a bit more quickly, so it's not entirely wasted, but it has caused more problems than it's solved, to be honest, by just causing the, the artillery to wake up and start shelling everything, and then causing biter attacks, but... Yeah, never mind. You know, it's 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 sort of kind of worthwhile, maybe ish. We've also done heavy assembly, which is the um, the third um, irid iridium um, intermediary. So you make the uh, the plates, then you make the beams, then you make the um, then you make the bearings. Then you make the composites, then you make the heavy assemblies. Okay, so it's about the fifth one of them, actually, in that case. So it's quite a long, quite a long way in, um, but these are in, in, important ing ingredients for various different bits and pieces that we're going, to be, we're going to be producing later on, I'm sure. But they're very much an intermediate. You can't use them for anything directly, but they'll, be, they'll come in very useful in the future. <clears throat> and with that one, we got Speed Module 8, which is um, which will give us a speed boost of 90%. That's amazing. Um, I... It's going to be incredibly expensive, though, so I don't know how many of those we'll make. Look at that, it takes 180 of those heavy assemblies I was just talking about, and eight Tier 4 material catalogues. Crikey. We've researched Personal Laser Defense Mark III. That'll be that'll be quite handy for when somebody tries to go in and clear out about some, one of those pyramids I've left behind, um, because they will do even more damage than the, than the lower ones. They'll probably take even more power, though, so we'll need to look into better powered power supply systems, but they're going to kick out a lot of damage. And you get both the submachine laser defense and the uh, sniper laser defense. I think I discovered that the, this one has a slightly higher dam uh, damage per second, whereas this one has a significantly longer range. So, you know, they're both good in their own ways. We picked up laser shooting speed 6, which um, basically, I mean, laser shooting speed, because the lasers fire constantly, um, I think that basically just means they do more damage over time, uh, or more damage per second than, than they would otherwise. Um, it's, it's slightly weird having a laser shooting speed for a, 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 beam, a beam weapon that fires constantly. But we did also get the energy weapon damage 7, which, which straight up means more DPS, a, a more powerful a, a laser. Um, I think the difference is this prob this one probably doesn't increase the amount of power used, it just increases the amount of damage output. Whereas increasing the speed will increase the damage output because it fires faster, but because it quite fires faster it will also use up more power. So the, the increasing the damage is better, but there's only a certain amount of that you can do. You, you eventually have to catch up by, you have to eventually have to do the laser shooting speeds as well, because we run out of the, the, the uh, science packs we need eventually, so we can't get, we can't get all of those straight up. Although, there are a few more we can get looking at that. And then to follow up with that one, we have Energy Weapon 8 is now in progress. So that'll be finished maybe sometime during the next stream. It's, um, it's 4,800 uh, science packs to do that one. So it's going to take a little while. Maybe if we make some of those uh, plus 90% speed modules and get them near the labs, that will help a little bit. We'll, we, shall, we shall see. And then finally, that brings us on to the death counter for the series. Well, it's, um, things didn't go too well for me once again. I've not had a good couple of weeks, to be honest. Um, <laughs> this has is, this is given me an extra two deaths, which has unfortunately nudged me above Mark. So now he is now, he is now, in, he is now dropped down to third place in the, in the death counter Matron, uh, moving me back up to second place. Uh, with about a third of the number Mike has got, but still, it's getting closer than I would like it to. Put it put it that way. Um, I, I, I am going to try. Uh, I'm going to try very hard not to die too many more times over the next uh, next few episodes. <laughs> Tristan's still down at one though, which is quite impressive. Uh, and it looks like one of those was to a worm, and the other was to a biter. It was both inside here anyway. I guess one of them. Yeah, one of them I probably got stuck in the goo, and the other time I got my face eaten when I ran back in there. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. It all happened far too quickly. But it didn't go well. Uh, I shall try not to do that in the in future episodes. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. We will be back on Monday when we will carry on with this. I shall try and get the um, the Vulcanite supply on this planet running much, much faster, much more, just much more, basically. I don't know why the bots have stopped ripping this stuff up. Maybe it's out of, maybe they're out of, it's out of, no, it's not out of range. I, I don't know. Maybe I've probably broken something somewhere in the middle. Oh, yeah, it looks like I've I've um, broken the connection between these two uh, robot ports because this one doesn't have power. Eh, that'll be fairly easy to fix. I'll probably put the pylon in there or something like that. So, we'll, yes, I'll be carrying on with the, uh, the 
the Vulcanite production and everyone else will be carrying on with all of the stuff they're trying to produce. We'll get the spaceships up and running. We'll get the spaceships drift travelling backwards and forwards, carrying massive quantities of everything we could possibly need and then everything will be amazing. Everything will be so much better. We'll fix all of our problems and, and, uh, and, and go sailing on into deep space science. Okay, no, we won't do all of that next week. It's going to take a lot longer than one, one stream to do all of that. But those are the sort of things we're going to be working towards. I'll also be streaming on uh, Wednesday when I should be playing XCOM 2 again. We ha I had a really good stream last week. I had some really... I want to claim that, that I, I did really, really well against two of the Chosen, but if I'm being honest, I think I just got really, really lucky um, with a couple of particularly good um, stabs from uh, from a couple of my rangers. So yeah, it was, but it was a lot of fun. I had a, I had a really good stream. So yeah, please come along next week if, you're, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you aren't coming along anyway, because it's a, it's a great series. I'm also going to start releasing some um, XCOM videos uh, at random random times during the week as well. So keep an eye out for those because I'm uh, I'm going to be playing with some of the sort of some of the legacy missions in there, some of the challenges. I think that's pretty much everything until uh, the, the until next week's catch up videos. So uh, once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.